The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Festool. Faster, easier, smarter. And by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. Now in preparation for Safety Week, I sent out a blog post asking you guys to send me questions, concerns, suggestions, things that you wanted to know concerning just any kind of safety issue that came to mind. And I got a lot of emails, so unfortunately I'm not going to be able to get to every one of them, but at least I'll get to a few of the main ones that I thought would be uh, the most important to the general audience. So let's jump right in. So the first suggestion comes from Eric Olson. He says, one challenge many of us face is working with small parts on a table saw or router table. A video showing some techniques for safely working with these small parts would be helpful. All right, well, you know, the thing is when it comes to small parts, sometimes some parts are just too small. You just don't want to use that particular tool to do it. So there are certainly limits. And uh, over the years, I've found that so it's just better to avoid those and find other ways of doing it that tend to be much safer. So if you're cutting really, really tiny, tiny thin pieces, you know, maybe the table saw isn't the right place to do it. How about the bandsaw? Okay, because the bandsaw doesn't really have as much of a chance, well, in most cases, it, no chance of kicking back because it's just the constant downward pressure. And as long as you're pushing through, you could put that fence, I mean, we cut veneer on there, right? So you could put really, really tiny pieces on the bandsaw. The only thing you have to contend with is that you get a little bit more of a rough cut. And that's where a drum sander or even just using a hand plane to smooth out that edge afterwards really works well. But when you are working with small parts that are within a reasonable size uh, on the table saw, let's start there, there's a number of things that I use to make that a lot safer. One of the most frequently used items when it comes to cutting thin strips, and this is, eh, this is a little bit big, for this example because uh, I would go quite a bit smaller than this uh, for my smallest pieces. But what I use is the gripper. It's, the, it's spelled G-R-R-R-I-P-P-E-R. Uh, it's made by Micro Jig and it's a great push block essentially. If you look on the bottom here, it's got different supports where you could sort of move this one in and out. And the idea is that it goes right over the blade safely. Let me show you an example of cutting with this. See, now, the other thing is the, the smallest piece I'll cut at the table saw is about a quarter inch, and even that's pushing it a little bit. But as long as I could fit this arm, you know, this support here between the blade and the fence, I'm pretty comfortable using this particular push block to push it through. Now, the way this works is really pretty cool. You've got the support leg on the outside that kind of helps you balance, because without it, if you're doing a very thin strip, you kind of have this tendency to tilt one way or the other. So this allows you to balance it out so that it stays nice and flat, level with the surface of the, the table saw. Now these pieces in here are adjustable depending on the location where you're making the cut and how much support you need. So a lot of times you can have this between the blade and the fence, or if you have a really skinny piece, you put this on the other side and have that between the blade and the fence. And if you can, it's a good idea to adjust it so that this supports the left side of the workpiece and this supports the right side of the workpiece. Okay, so you use the workpiece itself to get everything in line and then put it over the blade like so just to make sure that you're gonna clear the blade. And ours looks pretty good here. Let me double check. Oh yeah. So now I'm supporting it on both the left and the right side of the piece. I'm able to apply downward pressure, uh, pressure into the fence, and pressure forward. And that's all the things that you're going to need to do a piece that's this skinny to do that safely. You could use one of these skinny little push sticks, but when you do that, you don't have much control over the workpiece. Uh, you could use a feather board, which would certainly help. Feather board right before the blade like so. That would help, but now you've got an issue where we're, we're pushing from back here. You have an issue of this piece wanting to come back up at you, so you're gonna need to hold it down as well. So you're doing a lot more. This is a much more manual way of doing it, and that's why I like this system, because it does all three of those things, in, down, and forward, all at once.
So how about thin pieces? A thin piece, the tendency is, as you push it through, it really starts to vibrate a lot and it wants to push back and lift up just because there's not a whole lot of mass in the front of the workpiece. So depending on where you're making the cut, you can use a lot of different things to help hold it down. First of all, if there's enough room, you could certainly use your hands. Uh, you know, I like to hold down with my left hand and toward the fence, but use my right hand as my pushing device, essentially. Um, you could certainly use something like this. This is just a homemade push, uh, push block. It's got a little, about a quarter inch lip on the back end here, which is really nice because now I could hook it onto the back it catches on the back of the workpiece and applies this sort of pressure at the front, which really helps me get a lot of control and keeps my hands out of the danger zone. Um, using something like these skinny push sticks, not a real good idea on workpieces like this, because we're actually probably, in this case, making the problem worse. As you're pushing forward, you can't help but push down uh, back here, which, what's that gonna do? You're only helping it do exactly what the momentum of the blade wants it to do, and that's come right back at your head. So that's never a good thing. Another thing you can consider are the board buddies. We've probably shown these a couple times before, but these anchor onto the fence itself. They hold the workpiece down by putting pressure this way, and they also stop it from rotating in the opposite direction coming toward you. So it performs a double duty there. And of course, the feather board is always very helpful, although it doesn't really help you keep it from lifting, it will keep it up against the fence, and now all you have to do is worry about holding it down. Uh, these push blocks are also very handy to have around too because these cover a nice large surface area, just like the, uh, like the gripper, and as long as this doesn't go into the blade, you're in pretty good shape. Also consider that if you have a push block completely made out of wood, something that's safe to cut, you can make sacrificial versions of this that'll eventually get all chewed up and you'll throw it away and replace it. But it's okay as long as you have enough buffer zone to actually run that piece over the blade, let's assume we're running through, and actually cut into your push block. As long as it's made out of wood, it's perfectly safe. Uh, and make sure you have plenty of room between where your hand is uh, and where the, uh, the blade is cutting. This may not be the ideal one to use for that. I'm just kind of using this as an example. If I were doing something like that, I'd want a little bit more distance between my hand and the blade. Now for little short pieces, like this guy here, you have to be really careful because we're not just concerned about the off cut in this case, we're also concerned about how are we gonna secure this piece safely. Now even on this, uh, you know, I've got a decent miter gauge here. As I'm pushing this piece through, my hands are way too close to that blade. I can't hold it like that safely. So in order to make a cut on a piece like this, I'm gonna to wanna to clamp this sucker because I don't want my hands to have anything to do with that. Now once that's securely clamped in position, I can then push it through pretty safely and be confident that it's not gonna fly in my face. Now a miter gauge is good, but in the case of small parts, a miter sled is even better. See, on the miter gauge, you have to deal with the fact that the workpiece is experiencing friction because it's actually touching the table surface and experiencing that motion as you push it through. On a crosscut sled, the workpiece sits on the sled and the sled is touching the table, but the workpiece isn't moving at all. So it tends to be quite a bit more stable. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a crosscut sled to show you. Uh, a couple of years ago, I wound up taking mine apart they weren't built very well, and I had a lot of other ways of accomplishing those same tasks using my uh, miter saw and my, um, the Festool MFT, and also, of course, my miter gauge. So I really didn't have a need for one. And lately, though, for examples, and, and just there's a few tasks that a crosscut sled just excels at, so maybe in the future I'll build a new one. But that's generally how I handle uh, the small parts, is using anything but my hands to hold it. I'll cut some small parts at the miter saw, but uh, that can get pretty dicey too because it's even more difficult now to get that clamp in position. Uh, you definitely don't want your hands within that safe zone on the, uh, the miter saw. So. Um, but with these tiny pieces, you, you just gotta be careful. And sometimes, sometimes it's just best to cut them with a handsaw or something if it's too small. If, the bottom line is if your internal alarm, you know, your spidey sense tingles, don't do it. Figure out another way to do it or redesign the part so it can be done a different way. Now Eric also asked about using small parts at the router table. And you know, that's one of those things. The router table has burned me one too many times for me to continue using uh, small parts on it. Most of the time I find other ways to do it and a lot of times it's hand tools. So if I need to create a little round over, 
Jeez, I mean, it's so easy to do with either sandpaper, a rasp, you know, a block plane. There's just no reason to force myself to use it on the machine when I could do it with another much safer, much more comfortable means. Uh, but there are times when you have these certain small parts, most of the time I find that you, you'll have to build a specific jig or something that stabilizes that workpiece. And you may not use that on any other piece. It may be very specific for that project. But if you need the uniformity and consistency that you can get with a machine, that may be your only choice. And you know, you just gotta do what you have to do, design the jig for that part, and then put it on the wall and hope that someday you'll be able to use it again. But to be completely honest, I absolutely avoid at all costs, as much as possible, doing small parts at the router table. Now, if the piece is, you know, not super tiny, but big enough that I, I just maybe need to round over um, some edges. I think someone in the past, maybe one of our questions of the week on the website, asked about routing the outer perimeter of um, yo-yo blanks. My suggestion was to just get basically a piece of plywood, double stick tape all of the blanks to the plywood surface, and then use like a laminate trimmer around the outside. I feel much more comfortable in that case, as long as the piece is stable, uh, using a small router and taking it to the workpiece instead of taking the workpiece uh, to a router table. All right, our next question comes from Steve in Canada. He says, my safety issue concerns the stacked dado. What are the safety concerns one needs to be aware of in using the stack dado? For wider cuts involving several four tooth chippers, the teeth are very close together. How tightly does the arbor nut need to be? I wouldn't want the teeth to be able to shift. Exactly, that would be incredibly bad if that happened. Um, so Steve, the only thing that I can think to do is actually show you how I install mine, and hopefully that will show you what you need to do on yours. So when installing the dado blade, you wanna make sure that the surface is clean and free of any dust and debris, because that can lead to uh, you know, the, the, the blades being sort of skewed and you want them to rest perfectly flat against each other. So make sure you keep your blades nice and clean. In fact, mine has a little bit of rust going on here, so I'm probably gonna have to clean this up pretty soon, but it's still nice and flat. There's no dust here. So I'll put on my outer blade and I'll put on a couple chippers. Now, I don't really worry about the teeth at this point. I kind of try to stagger them, but they tend to move around anyway. So no reason to get too stressed out about it now. And we'll put on the outer blade. Okay. And now I just look at it from the front here and I just make sure every tooth is in a gap between the other teeth. And you want to make sure that you actually give it a little bit of breathing room. You don't want them right next to each other because there's material behind the teeth here that actually lead to, you know, sort of it's raised a little bit. So you don't want that right next to another tooth. So try and get that, the uh, chipper teeth in between the teeth of the outer blades, like directly centered. And then you could be sure that it's not gonna touch. So once everything looks pretty well staggered like that, then I start tightening it down. Now these are moving as I'm doing this. So I'm gonna have to check again to make sure. Now it's just finger tight right now. So now I can be confident that these really aren't gonna move very much. And if they do move, um, they're not going to hit tooth to tooth because they're, they're nice and snug now. Oops, see, screwed it up. And it is a good idea. You don't want your chipper teeth to be so close to each other either. Stagger it so you get a nice consistent uh, clean cut and it helps the blade not work quite as hard. Okay, and that looks pretty good. So now, tightening it. This is what really all I do. I don't know how to explain it other than to just show you. It's finger tight right now. And that's it. I'm not banging on this thing. I'm not uh, forcing it any more than it wants to go. That was all I had to do to tighten it. Now, assuming the blades are nice and clean, you're gonna have good metal-to-metal -metal contact. You just don't need to crank down on that thing. It's really no different than installing a regular blade. I just, I really don't put too much pressure on it. Um, just enough to snug it in place, or um, you do anything more than that, it's gonna be a real pain in the butt to get that arbor nut off of there later. Another thing to be concerned about is most times when you're doing uh, a dado cut, you're not cutting all the way through. So that means if your splitter is above your blade, you're gonna have a problem. So make sure you take your riving knife or splitter out. Mine's really snug. Okay. And you just make sure that that's not gonna be in the way. 
Now another thing to notice is that I can't use my regular insert, the zero clearance insert, for this because the blade is too wide. So I'm going to use my manufacturer's dado insert. Now that's good. It's certainly better than using nothing at all. It closes up that gap, but there's still too much of a gap to the left and right of the dado for me to call it uh, a zero clearance insert. Well, here's the deal. Every time you set up your dado stack, you're doing a different width. So it's really hard to get those to be an exact fit. But if you do a lot of work with a certain plywood or a certain material, or a lot of your work is three quarters of an inch, you can always get these types of inserts or make your own out of wood and have them sized perfectly and just mark them three quarter inch, half inch. And then you, know, then you can also write down and mark which blades you use so that when you are doing that particular width, you have the exact insert that matches up perfectly. And that's gonna give you incredibly good results and nice clean cuts. I just haven't done that, and I would probably say it's just laziness, uh, but the manufacturer's insert works pretty well for, for my purposes. Now, the only thing that I find to be pretty different about running a piece through uh, the dado stack versus running through a simple blade is the fact that you do have a lot of material being removed. So I don't like to cut really deep, and I don't like to cut too fast. You really have to give it time for the blade to do its job. And you also have to hold that workpiece with a lot more force so that it doesn't push back. There's just so much momentum on that uh, and so much uh, power behind that blade that if you even you know, relieve pressure for just a second, you could have a missile on your hands. Um, so I'll run a, a piece through, and I'll cut a dado, and I don't think you'll necessarily be able to visualize the difference, but um, just know that I'm putting quite a bit more pressure down on that piece to make sure I hold it nice and true up against the fence. Now we got another great question from Abraham Brionis. I think I'm pronouncing that right. He says, related to safety questions, I've been interested in the final disposition of rags, brushes, and finishing items containing flammable substances. Is there any federal law to dispose them properly, or what are the better practices according with health and environmental care? It's an awesome question, and I actually called uh, the local Arizona authority here, had a conversation with a really nice lady who sort of ran me through what the rules are, and what people should do because they're two different things. In reality, hazardous waste produced by a homeowner is not subject to any sort of regulation, federal or state, as far as this, again, just reporting what I've been told here. So if you know something different, please let me know. This is the best information I could get. Um, so we're really not required to do anything. So if I am done with this polyurethane, I can just throw it in the garbage kind of odd, right? I mean, it's not what we want to do, but technically, unless you're producing mass quantities of this stuff, you really don't have to do anything. Uh, I asked the woman on the phone, is it better to take the leftover polyurethane, put it in a nice shallow, uh, wide container, let the liquids evaporate off outside, and then just throw away the resin? And she said that that is better than putting the liquid into the trash, but still, it's not the best way to do things, even though it would be legal, technically, to do it. Her recommendation is to find local reclamation centers, uh, places that take hazardous materials and either dispose of them properly uh, or recycle them. And basically, keeping the stuff out of landfills is really the big key here. Uh, she gave me a great website. It's earth911.com. All you need to do is go there, put in your local town, or put in the material, a zip code also works, put in the material that you're trying to find a place to take it, and it will give you all of the centers in your area where you could take this stuff and have it disposed of properly. So polyurethane, mineral spirits, uh, ethanol, lacquer, any of this stuff that's flammable, toxic, hazardous in any way, you're just better off taking it there and disposing of it. Uh, you asked about rags and things like that. Typically with rags, because there's, especially if they're oily rags, there's an immediate concern about fire. Those, I just spread them out on, uh, on the floor, let them dry. When they're nice and crusty, then I throw them in the regular garbage. In fact, I think I've got some on the floor over there now, uh, drying up. So um, essentially, that's really it. Uh, we're homeowners, most of us. So we're not subject to the same sort of hazardous material disposal regulations that we would be if we were full-fledged businesses. But just a few common sense things. Don't mix your chemicals. You certainly don't want to start doing that because you never know exactly what you're going to get as a byproduct of doing that. So keep them separate. And that way when you take them to the reclamation center, 
or one of these hazmat disposal places, they'll know how to dispose of it properly because they know exactly what it is or they have a much better idea if it's relatively pure as opposed to something that uh, you know, has two or three chemicals mixed in.